It is all about Jesus. Amen? Today we're going to be talking about love's source. We can't know what love is without knowing who love is. We live in a technological age. Would you agree with me? I mean, everywhere you look, there's all type of electronics and technology. And for years, we've had this ability to be able to plug several devices into an amplifier or into a TV. And at whatever time we put the right source in the right place, then that particular unit will come on. That's been for years we've had that. For instance, in my office, I have an amplifier. I can set it to, to uh, the computer, and the music from the computer will come out, or I'll turn the source over to my record player. <laughs> I have a record player. How many of you still have a record player? I love records. So I turn it to my record player. Uh, if I wanted to hook up a cassette player, I could do that. If I wanted to hook up a DVD player, I can do it. But I have to have it on the right source. It's extremely important that you do this. All these units can be plugged into one, but if you don't put it on the right source, really the unit becomes uh, pretty much worthless. The record player will not work if it's not turned on to the record player part of the source. See, the whole, this whole concept really comes to kind of haunt me at my house because Cindy is not very technology oriented. How many of you know that? Now, for Cindy, if you put a remote in her hand, you might as well put a big book of how to repair a car in her hand because under the hood of a car is very foreign to Cindy. A remote is very foreign to Cindy. And if you give her a remote and it doesn't work exactly right, she starts pushing buttons. And then you get into a really big problem. Because on occasions, when she tried to push those buttons, and the source wasn't right, and the TV wasn't right, and it wasn't doing exactly what she wanted, she would say this, if this TV doesn't work right, I'm going to throw this remote into that TV. How many of you have ever heard anybody say that before? Get frustrated enough, that's what you want to do. Well, I can promise you one thing. That will get your attention. When your wife is telling you, it's not working, especially if they're not home to fix it and put it exactly where it wants. And she says, it's fixing to go in there, then you fix the problem. So now when I go to bed at night, she goes to bed before I do, or whenever I'm not there, I put the remotes exactly in the same place. I have the sources set to exactly the same spot every time. So that when she comes in, she has maybe the on button to push, and everything works. Because I don't want to come home one day and take the remote out of my TV. <laughs> so, I got it worked out. The right source in electronics is critical. You would agree to me. But knowing the right source for love is way more critical than knowing the right source for electronics. 1 John 4, 7 through 10. I'm using the King James Version today. Normally I do the NIV. But some of the wording here really appeal to me. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knowing, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Let's expose the scripture here for just a few moments. In this passage, the word love is used nine different times. Let us love one another. Love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If you love not, you know not God. God is love. The love of God was manifested towards us. Here is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. Now, if you look at that verse of Scripture, there's a whole lot of loving going on, isn't it? See, prior to this verse, if you look at expose the Scripture, starting in 1 John 3.10, John begins to teach us how to see Christian love. And John teaches us these things. If you look at the Scripture before the Scripture, John teaches what love is not. So if you want to know that, if you've ever been curious to say, hey, 
what uh, what love is not. I mean, if it, what is love? I mean, if it's not this, that, the other. If you want to look at that, go to that particular scripture. If you want to know what love is, you can go to that scripture. What love does for believers, you can go to the scripture. How to see the love of God, you can go to the scripture. All the scriptures leading up to the scripture I read a few moments ago tells us those things. What love is not. What love is. What love does for believers. How to see the love of God. And now in this verse of scripture today, John teaches the source of love. And we'll look at two things regarding the source of love very quickly. Defining love. And applying love. So let's define love. We all talk about love. We say we love, we feel love, we experience love, we care about love, we want love, yet if you really get down to this, many of us really don't understand love, so we need to define it. Now many of you will be familiar with this, I want to know what love is, I mean you know what that is. I didn't do too bad of a job on that, huh? Part of it would be proud. 1984, Power Ballad, recorded by Parnum. I want to know what love is. The, the song is their number one hit. It's one of their favorite songs. I mean, it's one of the biggest songs hits today. It remains one of the band's best known songs. And the lyrics of the chorus go like this. I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. I want to feel what love is. I know you can show me. See, the lyrics show it's here in many, uh, people, many people's guard regarding this love. They want to know what love is. Many people will ask that question. You may have asked somebody ask you that question. What is love? I want to know what love is. But the question really isn't what is love. The question is who is love? See, if you're looking for what love is, then you're looking for love in all the wrong places. I don't know what it is, but when I put this together, there's so many songable things that just kept coming out. I think there's even more to come. I don't know. But if you want to know, if you're saying, I want to know what love is, you're looking in the wrong place. Because you have to know and understand who love is. See, the song should say, I want to know who love is. And when you experience the answer and apply it to your life, then you're on an eternal love train. There's even a song called Love Train. And <clears throat> don't know how all that happened. See, the love which the New Testament expounds upon is a consuming passion for the well-being of others. And this love has its wellspring from the love of God. I'm going to say that again. I want you to really listen and pay attention to this. The love which the New Testament expounds upon is a consuming passion for the well-being of others. And this love has its wellspring from the love of God. Amen. Study God's Word. This is what you'll get from God's Word. When someone says, I have a hard time loving other people. You ever hear anybody say that? Man, ah, ah, this is really, I have a hard time loving other people. Any of you in here ever said that before? That, that, that person I went, oh, have a really, really hard time loving them. And you know what? The root of your love or their love is from God. Can't be. Because God is love, and those who abide in Him manifest His loving character. So we've answered this question who is love? We can easily say God is love. And to be a person who loves like God, you have to emulate His character. You can't say, okay, now I understand. Define love. God is love. That's it. That's cool. That's okay. You have to find him. You have to emulate his love. You have to emulate his character. You have to be who God is to show God's love. When asking people the question, who do you want to be like, it's not very common that people are going to say, God, that's who I want to be like. Every once in a while, you might catch a sports star or some movie star, somebody who has a good walk with the Lord and they really love the Lord. And, and so you may say to them, hey, who do you really want to be like? God, that's who I want. You don't really get that very often, do you? Yet our ultimate goal should be to emulate who He is. God is love, and for us to love on any level as God, we have to be like God. 
Our personalities will not love anywhere near the level of our God's love. God has to dwell in us. And we have to live God's personality. It has to come out through us for us to love like God loves. See, if Carl, me, if my personality, if it shows through, I'm just going to tell you, on the love meter, it's going to be low. And when it does come to loving certain people, I am going to say, on my own terms, my personality, I have a hard time loving that person. But if God's personality shows through me or you, the love meter just goes up to the roof, doesn't it? It explodes. The requirement of Christian love relates to the very nature of God Himself. We are loved as a response to God's own love and to His loving activity in Christ and in the church. So it'd be one thing to define love, which we've done, and to even start talking about emulating it and God's personality living through us, but God isn't just the definition of love. God showed us and continues to show us His love to the extreme. God applied His love, didn't He? He just didn't look down and say, Hey, everything is kind of a mess. I sure love these people. And didn't do anything about it. He said, I love my, man, my creation, mankind. And I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to apply my love to them. So let's look at applying love. Romans 5, 8 says... But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now is there some power in that verse of Scripture? Dwell on that thought for a few moments. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ Died for us. See, the proof of God's love for people is that He sent His only begotten Son to provide eternal life for us. And that demonstration of love by God is our model for showing love to others. As God displayed His love in us by sending Jesus Christ, He displays His love among us now as we love one another. And since no one in, in you know, all eternal humanity is beyond the reach of our Savior's sacrificial death, no brother or sister should be beyond our sacrificial love. There is absolutely nothing in our lives that we can compare to the sacrificial death of Jesus. Think about that for a few moments. There is absolute, there's nothing in our lives that we can compare to the sacrificial death of Jesus. Think about that. You've had people sacrifice for you. You've sacrificed for people. There's no doubt about it. We've all done it. I've had some uh, sacrifice for me. This past Christmas, we were at here at my son's house. And we always let the kids and the grandkids open all their Christmas presents. And at the very end, it's going to like, okay, Father and Dad, we have a couple presents for you. Well, this past Christmas, I'm opening up one of my presents. And I look, and there's a picture of some people who are doing some offshore fishing. But well, then I began to realize that, that was my present. I was going to get to go offshore fishing. Well, for me, that's exciting. I like that. That's unbelievable. But then the ball hit me. That's expensive. And I thought, wow, my kids are really sacrificed to be able to pay for this, for me to do this experience. And I became overwhelmed. And the next thing I know, I got tears. <laughs> Have you ever been there before? Somebody sacrificed or do something for you that's just so overwhelming? Or in that moment you're thinking, wow, that must really care for me. I mean, that must really, really love me to be able to give me that. And that's how I'm in tears. See, I cried over the sacrifice of my kids, that the sacrifice they made for my fishing trip. There isn't anything wrong with that. But when was the last time I went up? Oh, the love, love of God who sent His Son to sacrifice His life for me. When was the last time I, I really was overwhelmed with the love of God in such a way that I felt when I sat and I thought for just a second that God loved me so much that He sent His Son to die. My Son gave me a fishing trip. God sent His Son to die. When's the last time? I allowed that thought to come in me in such a way that I got emotional. But see, Jesus went on a trip, didn't he? On an offshore fishing trip. 
Jesus went on a trip, and that trip surpasses anything beyond our comprehension. See, the trip where Jesus began with betrayal, and then being falsely accused, and then a beating, and then spit on, and a crown of thorns on his head, a journey to the cross, and then he was nailed to the cross. That ought to make me weep when I stop and think that God did that for me. God so loved so much He sent Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. That's a million dollar word. Propitiation. It means the turning away of wrath by an offering. The word propitiation carries the basic idea of appeasement or satisfaction, especially towards God. So propitiation is a two-part act that involves appeasing the wrath of an offended person and being reconciled to them. God was offended by the action of Adam and Eve in the dark philosophy. They broke the relationship with God. They did God so long for reconciliation. There was only one answer that was propitiation. Jesus turned away God's wrath to the way they by becoming the offering, the sacrificial lamb. Remember what happened with respect to God did not use a propitiation, which would still be the same on all the people way back in the Old Testament. Waiting for a Messiah. Waiting for that opportunity. God is a sinner's son. The God is a sinner's son. And he died on the cross. Why does that kind of sacrificial love make us weak? Maybe God would come out a little insensitive to it. You know, I've heard about that before. I've heard about, you know, what happened to Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about it. Oh, I'm going to hear about it again. Oh, Easter's coming up. I'm going to hear that story again. That's, it's a nice story, isn't it? I just love that story. God doesn't want us to sit around and weep over the love that Jesus showed us. He wants us to find that love, the love that Jesus showed us. He begins with a deep, compassionate love that encompasses our soul. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you say that in the spring? Say it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Say it with me one more time. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What God wants to be said is this. For Carl so loved his fellow man that He sacrificed in such a way to bring them to salvation. Would that be putting kind of two plus two together where the scripture talks about how much we should love each other and care for each other? And our love and care for each other is bound and rooted in Jesus Christ and God. And that what you should say? For Carl so loves his fellow man and sacrifice in such a way to bring him to salvation. Body love is the easiest part. Life is hard for me. Let me conclude with this. There's, There's a man named George, George Abbott, and, and he, he was, was only 15 years old, and he began to lose his eyesight. And George, George Abbott was one of these guys who got very concerned, so he went on to college, even though he was losing his eyesight. And his sisters even helped him with grief and Hebrew, and he was studying to be a minister. Eventually, George Abbott lost all his eyesight. But his spirit really collapsed when his young son said, He never, he never buried him. He didn't pain and rejection. He never fully left him. And then, and then one, one day, his sister came to him and said, Hey, I need you to let you know how I'm engaged. Well, uh, just as far back, back all the people that George had, and his engagement broke up all, and, and the rejection of what happened. He continued to just to think of God's love for him in that situation. God loves me. I've been rejected before. I've had him for my sister. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary 
to be here. Amen? Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> Last couple of months, there's just been so many people putting in so many hours to get the worship facility. If you, had, if you didn't see it before, uh, a couple of months ago, you just can't imagine what this room and all this area back here look like. And I think we just need to thank everybody for giving a hand. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So many hours of this video. Uh, we go, 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 go,